Good evening. This is episode number 14 of the Drunken UX podcast. This evening we are talking about design philosophy, and I am one of your hosts, Michael Feenan. I'm your other host, Aaron Hill. Be sure to check us out and connect with us on Twitter and Facebook slash Drunken UX and on Slack at drunkenux.com slash Slack to sign up. And I want to be sure to give a shout out to our sponsors. You can check them out at newcloud.com slash drunken UX. That's in ucloud.com slash drunken ux they do some interactive uh, mapping software if you want to see what they do go check them out this evening i am drinking i'm gonna okay aaron um here's here's the sixty four thousand dollar pyramid question what am i drinking what do you think i'm drinking i'm gonna guess scotch i'm gonna guess scotch well that sir is a, a pretty I good hope it's guess. not sixty four thousand dollars scotch though um no no it's uh <laughs> This evening we are uh, working on some Oban Little Bay. Um, Oban, I, I think I, I've had Oban on the show before. Um, it's one of my favorites. Little Bay is like a small batch um, scotch they do. It's not age statemented. Um, and so I'm guessing that this is a blend of something they do. They, it's a small cask aged scotch that I'm guessing they blend together. It's a little, uh, I would call it stormier than hmm. normal oban it's oh normal obans you know very accessible it's a very nice light flavor little bay is a little has a little bit more courage to it um that's a really <laughs> weird way to describe scotch, scotch that could that's uh, yeah it's, that yeah it's the little, the little scotch. bay scotch that could there um, you go. <laughs> it's not something i drink a lot of but it, when i feel like it it sure is nice to have I've what got do you got a, i got a, a vodka tonic with a slice of cucumber and some lime in it um, that sounds perfect for this heat. I know, right? It's been it, well. Today is the first day we didn't have ninety nope degrees outside, so <laughs> we actually got so it's a proper thunderstorm in. Um, yeah. But still, good drink. Don't, don't feel bad because we're picking up all that slack for you here in Kansas. I when I uh, ran out this evening, it was ninety five degrees. I don't know what it, what it got to in the afternoon, but uh, I know our heat index is well into triple digits here. So we oh, are. Yeah, we're 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 pulling some overtime on our uh, air conditioning. Mm -hmm. So this evening, uh, we want to talk about design philosophy, and I wanted to make sure that because I am a developer, um, I don't do design. I don't have a good artistic eye. I can take pictures. I like photography. I can write stuff. I I can put words together, but design not my strong suit. But this was a, a cool topic that I thought deserved some attention, and. I want to introduce everybody to Greg Putanovich. He is a UX design specialist. He is the head of experience at Expand the Room. Um, they are based out of New York City, and their sort of um, mantra, so to speak, is that they lead through purpose-driven design. Mm -hmm. If that sounds a little bit familiar, we've covered um, their article on purpose-driven design a few weeks back on Real-Time Overview, um, and uh, one of their other articles here a couple weeks ago um, that now escapes my uh, brain jelly. But uh, Greg, <laughs> welcome to the show. I hope you're drinking with us this evening. Uh, I am. Well, thank you for uh, thank you for having me on. I am drinking. Um, I'm having a Sam Adams Golden Ale, which is nice. apparently subtly sweet. It's smooth and refreshing, according to the label. It's 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 good. Does it does it meet the promise? It, it does meet its value promise. And I will tell you this, um, this is a little low rent uh, beer for, for being in New York. Uh, a lot of my coworkers would look down on me. And I actually over, I, I chose this over a, uh, I think a fairly sought after craft uh, IPA in my fridge. Because uh, fellas, I, I think there's actually some conspiracy going on with the, the piney, IPA, the hoppy IPA. I, I feel like there's some sort of like craft beer X prize for <laughs> the first IPA that will literally cave your head in because it's so bitter with, with hops flavor. And apparently this is like what everyone is after. Um, but I'm, I'm going to go for the uh, Sam Adams golden, golden. Ale. Just a bottle full of hops jam. It's that's, like that's carbonated turpentire. <laughs> <Yeah>. Amazing. <laughs> 
we're about to, to get our very first microbrewery here in Pittsburgh soon. So everybody's real excited about uh, <laughs> what that holds for the future of uh, beer in Pittsburgh, Kansas. So um, or drunk people. <laughs> yeah, I, I And I'm not a beer drinker myself. If that has not been apparent through what I drink on the show, uh, I <laughs> am a scotch guy. I like cider. Beer has just not been quite to my palate, but I'll, I'll be interested to try uh, what these folks are going to be making here. Um, but well, I hope you like it hoppy. <laughs> but it, I don't think our selection will quite make it to the New York levels of sophistication yet. But give us give us 10 years. We'll get there. I think it's a ruse. I, I, I actually think no one really likes the flavor of hoppy IPAs. I think I think they just pretend that is that like, uh, you know, fancy coffee drinking and stuff. The right. Or people... or like Yoko Ono. Like, no, like no one really likes that. You, you just sort of pretend <laughs> like it because it makes you seem avant garde and, and cool, I think. So in planning this episode, a little birdie told me that uh, you are something of a mixologist in your own right. And so I thought, you know, what better way to kind of get the show started? And when we are a podcast called Drunken UX, it seems only fitting that maybe we should consider having a signature drink. Mm. Um, so brainstorm with us, if you would. Uh, what do you think the perfect drink would be for a show called Drunken UX? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, just just sort of knowing... Knowing what I know about good user experience, I, I think, you know, the, the themes that always sort of come up are, um, you know, clean, elegant, modern. Um, you give me uh, way too much credit. <laughs> I, I think uh, I would go with the Vesper Martini. And that that is the original James Bond martini, like from the Ian Fleming novels. Okay. Um, it is uh, it is uh, two ounces of London dry gin, uh, a half ounce of vodka, which just sort of takes the edge off that off that gin, and then uh, like a quarter an ounce, like a bar spoon of Le Blanc, which is, is this sort of French, this sweet and bitter sort of French aperitif. Um, and then you uh, you shake it and serve it in a chilled cocktail glass with a uh, with a lemon twist, and it is amazingly good. Uh, everything you would want in a good user experience. Um, it's sort of effortlessly modern without being trendy. It's clean, elegant. It sort of you know it, it sort of epitomizes uh, simplicity, right? It's like just. It's as simple as it could possibly be and only as complicated as it absolutely has to be. So I, I, that's I like the, that would be uh, my, my uh, vote for the signature Drunken UX uh, cocktail. If anybody was wondering why we had Greg on the show to talk about this, there you go. I think that pretty much sums it up. Yeah, I think there. that's a wrap, guys. We're, we're done. Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> Thank you. So, now, if only, if only uh, you know, we could get clients to pay us to have me mix them drinks, that would be... I think that's called working at a bar. Right, yeah. <laughs> I, was at, I was at High Ed Web uh, about, what, three, four years ago, and um, one of the, it was in, when it was in Milwaukee, and one of the breweries that they took all the attendees to, um, they actually had a signature drink for the conference there as well, um, and it was quite good. I don't remember what it was called or what was in it. It was pink. I remember that. Uh, it had something to do with HTML, um, but not HTML. That was a different thing, but uh, <laughs> I don't know, that just came to came to mind um, thinking about that. At any rate, thank you, Greg. That's I think that'll be uh, episode fifteen. I'll mix up a, a shaker of those. Yeah, let me here. let me know how that uh, let me know how that works for you. So we are diving into design philosophy, which um, design philosophy is kind of an interesting subject for us to, to hit because it's not strictly a web thing. Design philosophy goes back, you know, decades upon decades and, and depending on how academic you want to get, you know, farther back than that. Um, and I want to start maybe by breaking down the difference between philosophy and principles, because everybody has principles on their website. Here's how we make a site. Here's how we will handle your project. Um, but Greg, help us understand and help the the audience understand how we break down this difference between what constitutes a design philosophy and what is just a set of principles. Sure. Yeah. Well, so, you know, design principles are essentially a collection of 
um, you know, sort of laws and uh, observations about, you know, human bias and human behavior um, that, that have sort of, you know, over time proven um, sort of so effective at solving design challenges uh, that they've been sort of universally adopted as, you know, sort of a, a toolbox, right? And so um, there, there are literally, you know, hundreds of design principles um, and, you know, I think, I think anyone who is just getting started as a designer or is curious about, you know, design has probably come across the universal principles of design, the, the, the book by, um, William Lidwell and, and, uh, uh, Jill Butler, that, that is, you know, sort of the, the go-to, you know, compendium of, of, you know, design principles. And so, um, you know, the interesting thing about design principles is no one really invents them. They're, they're not anyone's, you know, IP or anything like that. These are things that just sort of exist. And if anything, you know, someone might come along and put a name to it, right? So a, a good example of a design principle is the flexibility trade-off, right? Which, which basically is a design principle that states that as you increase the flexibility of a design, you are you are sort of inexorably going to decrease the um, the functionality and the performance of that design, right? Like like that is just sort of a law of the design universe. Um, and as a designer, if you can if you can sort of know that and and really understand it, um, it's a really sort of powerful tool to have in your arsenal. And so where I think you know, principles start to give way to a philosophy is when designers sort of put a stake in the ground about what they are going to do um, with, with their sort of knowledge of design principles, right? Knowing about the flexibility trade-off, like is, do I have a point of view um, about how design should be in the world, how designers should do their work, um, you know, that, that, you know, that, that somehow, you know, reflects a, a belief that I have in, you know, the, the principle of, of the flexibility trade-off or the principle of, you know, the effects of red on, you know, how we sort of, you know, how we sort of perceive sites or, uh, you know, like per perceived designs. Um, so, you know, to me, it's sort of, you know, a, a philosophy is, is sort of, uh, you know, more about, um, your your code as a designer, how you are going to apply, um, you know, the, the the whole sort of spectrum of, of design principles. The flexibility trade-off you mentioned reminds me a little of our last episode about functional CSS, where we just started discussing how the specificity of selectors affects the um, the performance of it, and so you have to like balance how how performant you want it to be versus how like elegant and cascading you want your CSS to work. Right. And, you know, just as you sort of mentioned, like this isn't, you know, this isn't a purely digital thing, right? I mean, the, the, the sort of clearest mm -hmm. illustration of the flexibility trade-off um, sort of, you know, is, is often sort of illustrated through a Swiss army knife, right? Like a Swiss army knife is an incredibly flexible tool, but I don't think anyone would argue that any of the tools on the Swiss army knife are, are as optimal or as performant as the sort of single tasking tool that they are replacing, <laughs> right? So if you're, you know, if you're going on a 10 mile hike in the woods and you want to take a bottle of wine, that wine opener um, on your Swiss army knife is probably going to be good enough. And what you get in terms of, you know, a compact multi-tool design and not having to carry, you know, a bunch of specialty tools is probably worth the, the trade off. But if you're a sommelier working in a you know busy restaurant and you're going to open a hundred bottles of wine in a night, like there's no way that tool would be mm -hmm. that that flexibility trade off would be worth it, right? You would want sort of the the most highly performant, highly optimized wine opening single tasking tool you could you could get your hands on. Mm -hmm. I think the the version of that that um, is sort of in my world is the multi tool, the Leatherman multi tool. As a theater <laughs> guy, every back backstage hand uh that does set design anything like that every single one of them has a multi-tool because it comes in handy for literally anything you're doing backstage but any 
carpenter, they may own one, but they're not going to build a house with with the multi tool. They're going to yeah, or not a mechanic, <laughs> right? You know, isn't gonna isn't gonna like if you got in a pinch, you could probably you know get get the lug nuts off of a you know off of a wheel with a multi tool. Maybe that's a bold claim. I'm going to fact check that, but let's just go with that for a second. But if you were an auto mechanic, right, and you're changing, if you if you work at you know Midas and you're changing tires all day long, right, that would be that would just be right. That that would be. But you know the thing about you know the thing about these principles is you know again like they just sort of they just sort of live in the wild, you know, and, and people they they sort of emerge over time. And I think actually, you know, like an analogous um, you know an analog an analogous example, you know, that I think about. For developers are things like, um, you know, the model view controller pattern, right? Oh. Like, like no one invented that, right? Just over time, developers started to notice that, like, if you sort of modularize and break out your code this way, it makes it a lot easier to, you know, to make updates, right? And it makes it a lot easier to sort of, when when you can separate the presentation layer from the logic layer and and in your sort of your data model, right? Or mm -hmm. things like decorators or factories, right? Like, no one invented those. Maybe someone put a name to them at some point after they realized, like, oh yeah, this is I, like people are you know doing this a lot. So, I mean, that's kind of the cool thing about these design principles is they don't really um, belong to anyone. And you know, the truth is that's probably the same thing about a design philosophy. Um, when we wrote ours, um, you know, we got sort of hung up on this idea briefly. Um, that you know we needed to come up with something really groundbreaking, something really original, right? And and um, I, I think that's I think that that's you know a real pitfall for people who who are sort of trying to articulate and and you know formulate their own code as a designer because the truth is it's very unlikely you're going to say something that hasn't ever been said. If you're lucky, you might articulate something in a, you know, something that, that people know in a, in a new way. Um, and what we sort of quickly realized is that a, the, the value of a design philosophy is that it be authentic, right? We sort of figured out that um, as long as it represented who we truly are, as long as it was, you know, sort of true to the core of who we are as an organization, who we are as, as designers, then it would work and, and people would, would respond to it. It would resonate. Um, and so, you know, we were able to sort of like curb this, this, this sort of obsession with, you know, with originality um, and, and really just embrace the idea of, of, of sort of authenticity and, and really being, you know, true to ourselves. And a lot of this, like I say, there's a lot of remix that happens here. There's a lot of blending of of ideas. Um, as we kind of roll the clock back, I started out by saying, you know, design philosophy isn't a web thing. Design is has applied to everything for, you know, the entirety of commerce and culture and, you know, dating back as far back as you want to go. Um, and around the 1940s-ish, we started to really start looking at this in a much more academic way. Um, and I think that when it comes to web design, it's important to know where you came from to know where you're going on mm -hmm. some of that. And yeah. um, so to, you know, we'll, we'll throw around and we'll do this throughout the, the show. We'll be, you know, we'll throw around some of these names and, and labels, but go look these up, you know, on your own. We'll have links to several of them, of course, in the show notes, but um I want to emphasize that, you know, there is this sort of academic nature that, you know, people get degrees on design. They go to school to learn this stuff and it what? takes them years to, you know, absorb and assimilate it all. We're going to talk for an hour. So <laughs> I apologize if we are a, a little bit, uh, you know, shallow maybe on some of these. But when I think about um, design, one of the people that has always stood out to me that, you know, I've, I've read about him, I've looked at the work he's done is Dieter Rams, who mm -hmm. was an industrial designer at Braun right. uh, during the late 40s, early 50s. And he's the guy that came in and established this idea of function over form. Um, and, you know, it, now we, we're coming out of World War II at that point, um, which, of course, World War II was sort of, you know, an austere time, so to speak, in terms of design. But prior to that, when we think about, like, the Art Deco period and things, you know, beautiful design was everywhere cars into the 30s were all about curves and and uh and flow and 
Rams's idea was you build the thing to do what it has to do and let everything else flow from there. Uh, and it's his mentality. And he worked at Braun all the way up into the nineties. If my memory serves me right on that. And Braun was successful and profitable because of that strategy and because of that approach to thinking about their products. And it's even when you think about German engineering in general, I mean, that's a very German way of thinking that we're going to make something really good and we're just going to make it. We're not going to go overboard. We're not going to add flourishes to it that don't need to be there. Um, and that's one way of looking at it, but there are certainly others. Um, if we look at guys like Milton Glazer, who was all about the details and saying, you know, the details should delight, you know, they should make the thing fun to use and encourage people to use it. So these things are not immutable. There's nothing about these that are like, this is the way it has to be. It's about ensuring that the way that you are approaching this is right for the culture that you're operating in. Um, so, Greg, you mentioned design patterns earlier, like MVC or, or decorator. Would things like function over form or delighting users, would those be analogous to principles or philosophies? Well, I mean, I mean it's the same thing. Yeah. Well, no, I think, you know, I think it's a, yeah, I think it's a blurry line. Right. And, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I, I think, you know, the, the thing that's, I mean, just going back to, to Dieter Rams, right. Like, like this is a person who is, whose ideas are, are so in the sort of design milieu that, like you probably you know him and you probably don't even know that you know mm -hmm. his ideas right like he sort of famously created you know the 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 10 principles for good design right which you know were were just these sort of the are these sort of fundamental rules that you know you've definitely heard right everyone's heard the the idea of like function over form coming out of you know you know coming out of the art deco and coming out of the you know this, this time period where where things were were sort of were, were were sort of you know needlessly decorated and those decorations serve no functional purpose whatsoever, right? And so this idea that you know that a good design is at its core has to be something that's useful, right? Or that um, you know a, a good design you know makes something inherently understandable, right? It doesn't need an explanation. It is self evident. Um, and that in order to to achieve that, right, uh, you know, a good design has to be transparent and it also has to sort of be built to, you know, stand the, the test of times and it, it, you know, the test of time. And it can't be, you know, can't be sort of, you know, trend chasing and it has to be, um, you know, it has to be sort of as minimal as possible. Right. This idea that um, you just take away, take away, take away until there's nothing left to take away. And, and you're left with, you know, this, this beautiful, um, um, design, right. So the, you know, certainly, um, you know, there are, I, I think, you know, there are sort of hard and fast principles about the nature of simplicity, but what I think someone like Dieter Rams did was sort of take those ideas and turn them, um, on their head a little bit by sort of infusing them with his own personal values. Uh, to, to turn them into a philosophy, right? And and what he had what what he had to sort of back it up was an amazing body of work, right? Of beautiful products that were highly you know useful, and I think for for people who really connect with the that brand, meaningful and and you know had something you know even beyond um, being useful and, and being usable, right? They they had like a like a real sort of human connection to them. And to apply this in sort of an interesting uh, light for web design, um, one of Rams's principles is that good design is long lasting. Um, and, you know, in terms of web design, we tend to think of, you know, this constant cycle of iterating and redesigning and changing all the time. Um, and the biggest sites on the web do this, whether that's Amazon, Walmart just did their redesign recently and it was like a whole, you know, a whole thing. Um, but then when you think about good design is long lasting and think about a site like Craigslist um, <laughs> and, you know, the success they have had as a, as a site. And while, you know, their their site is minimalist, hinging on brutalist in some regards, it has been long lasting. And so they are checking 
you know, certainly some of those boxes. Now, is it innovative? Um, is it aesthetically pleasing? That's a little subjective, and I can't answer those, but it's it's not a matter of trying to check every box necessarily. Um it's almost a religious experience in a, in a lot of ways, right? Well, that's it, right? I mean, it's it, it is it, it may not be it may not be aesthetic, but it is beautiful. Like Craigslist, you know, I mean, just think of the social impact of of Craigslist, and and it's really easy to actually overlook how innovative it, it really is, you know. But it it was you know it is this perfect intersection of uh, you know a technology that that natively supports you know, one-to-one -one communication, one-to-many communication, the idea that anyone can publish, therefore anyone can sort of, um, you know, put up a, a, what, what's essentially an advertisement for something that, that they want to sell or a service that they want to offer or a job that they're, you know, that they're looking for. Um, and, and as a result, there is this entire ecosystem that, that is now so much a part of our culture, we, we almost overlook it. We totally take it for granted unless it's down. And then we freak out. <laughs> it's inevitable that that's going to happen at some some point in time. Wait, well, our Slack went down. Um, our Slack went down on uh, Monday, and it was like it was like the road war. I mean, it was like Lord of the Flies. By by ten o'clock, we had people, including myself, who are just in a full blown panic uh, because our because our <laughs> because the Slack servers were down. So thinking about this, you know, maybe in more modern terms, if, if folks want to kind of anchor these ideas and these people and, and thought processes, just because some of these folks were operating decades ago doesn't mean we aren't still innovating that area. And looking at guys like Donald Norman and Jared Spool and their work in experience design, experience design is there's a philosophy there to designing not necessarily just the little things on the page, but the way people interact with your product end to end and making sure that, you know, that is, you know, web design in that sense involves your social media channels. It involves your marketing. It involves all those little pieces to make sure that a person's experience with you is not just enjoyable for them or successful. Let's maybe use that phrase, but that it's also highly transparent. Um, and, that idea dovetails with guys like Naoto Fukasawa, who were very into uh, instinctivism and his print or his philosophy of without a trace. This idea that you shouldn't have to figure out how something works; it should just be obvious. Um, these things, you know, they they feed each other very well and are not, you know, they don't fight each other necessarily. No, I think that's I think that's exactly right. And if anything, they you know they sort of you know build on each other. And I think you know I think um, you know there's this there's this sort of interesting lineage of thought, right? You know, Don Don Norman is you know sort of famous for um, kind of coining this this idea of user centered design, right? Like 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 his book, The Design of Everyday Things, was was really this this sort of meditation on. Um, you know, the fact that the designed world really, ha you know, it, in order for it to, to be effective and, and in order for it to do good in the world, it has to sort of accommodate human error and human behaviors, right? So there's the, the famous, you know, the famous sort of um, example of the Norman doors, right? Which is a, you know, it's a door with a pull handle that you're supposed to push. And, um, you know, you, it, it, it's incredibly easy to a, you know, sort of trace the lineage of that sort of human centered thought all the way into how websites, you know, handle errors and, and things like that. But also later down the road when, you know, like people like, you know, Bill Modridge and the, you know, the people at IDEO sort of took the idea of user centered design and, and sort of elevated that to be human centered design, right? And, and really put this incredible focus on doing sort of all this, you know, user research, you know, before you ever even start a project to like fully frame and contextualize projects and really, um, you know, understand sort of like the human, the human problem that your, you know, that your design, you know, seeks to, to solve, right? Um, and so in many ways, you know, these, these great thinkers are just, are, are, are sort of building on each other and picking up where the, you know, the last person, um, left off, you know, so, so people, 
like you know Milton Glaser and you know who who are you know really these champions of of simplicity and and kind of like minimalism in design people like John Maeda come along and take take those those initial thoughts and really elevate them you know into into something like the the laws of simplicity um and sort of on and on it goes and and think about too from people feeding each other we can trace this just by looking at Apple, for instance, and look at Steve, how Steve Jobs approached design and how that fed into guys like Markula when he took over and then Jonathan, Jonathan Ivey as he's worked. You know, they, they paid attention to design details and pieces that weren't necessarily – Steve Jobs was – I mean, he was obsessed with details that literally – three other people would care about, you know, the, sure. when he get got in, if you look at like the old circuit boards from the old original apples, you know, he cared about the layout of those, you know, they get into this stuff about like laser etching logos onto their products and things like that in areas that you never see them. Um, and it's a lot of extra work and it's extra cost, but they care about those little things. And this is a very glazer sort of thinking, you know, those that the little details delight and that people, when they see that, it's like, Oh, wow. You know, that's that it reflects well, you know, and your perception, it is an influence of your perception then on that product that, wow, you go to this level of effort, you know, to make these parts work and be beautiful. Maybe the rest of your product is really great. It's a little manipulative, I think, but yeah. it's, it's, but it is true. And it does generate that kind of response. Wonderful. Well, and Apple's really, in oh, I'm sorry, Aaron, go ahead. Really quick. Related to what he was just saying, one of the articles in the Talking Points um, has a story about how Steve Jobs was talking about how if you were making a like handcrafted wooden chest, you would use, you know, you wouldn't use like cheap pine boards. You would use really nice wood, and you would use nice, you know, steel or iron fittings. And even though the back of the chest would probably never be seen, you're not going to just use plywood on it. You're going to use the same thing on that side, on the off chance that you maybe turn it around one day, or maybe someone does, or just even if no one ever sees it, you know that that product is quality from top to bottom. And yeah, and you know, Apple's really interesting, right? Because you know, on one hand, um, they have been, you know, these, you know, they were sort of the champions of, you know, the computer as a, you know, as something for as a tool for artists, right? Like was, you know, something that they kind of famously, um, you know, championed. Um, the computer yes. was expression, mm. right? But but on the other hand, you know, <laughs> Apple sort of famously doesn't user test, right? Which I think we all know is kind of BS, but they've kind of put this stake in the ground about, I can't remember the exact quote, and I'm sure one of the awesome uh, drunken UX listeners can <laughs> guys on social media and get the exact Steve Jobs quote. But, you know, it's it was very sort of Henry Ford-like in it, sort of like, <laughs> look, if I went out and... You know, if we, if we, you know, if we asked people what they want, um, you know, we would, we, you know, we never would have been able to make, you know, something as beautiful as an iPod or <laughs> something as beautiful as an iMac or, or whatever. Right. And so um, I guess, you know, that's, that's sort of a, I, I think a good example of taking a principle, right. This idea that iterative design is, you know, about this, this sort of test, build, analyze, I got those out of order. <laughs> Build, and then you test, and then you analyze, and, and you know, on and on it goes, right? And they they're sort of famous for saying, "No, we, we're not gonna, we're gonna skip that test part," right? And so mm -hmm. they've kind of taken this this you know this kind of universal principle of design and and made it put a stake in the ground about it. And 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 so I think kind of back to your original question, Aaron. Like I think that's how sort of principles start to to you know become a philosophy right so it's like the the choices that you make about which principles you choose and how you choose to use them um and i guess by extension which principles you aren't choosing um you know maybe you like for brutalism maybe you don't care about delighting users uh you just really really want some of that like brawn action sure some just straight theater roms to turn it up to 11. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I think like we always say, look, you know, like, you know, our eight principles, you know, they're certainly not the only principles we abide by, but they're, they're sort of the eight that um, if we can articulate them well, 
to you and you can understand them, you will know, you will know us pretty well. Like you'll know what we're about, right? You'll have it. You'll, you'll, you'll walk away and, and sort of either as a prospective client or, you know, as just someone in the design community that, that we want to, you know, sort of hang out with, you, you'll get who we are. Right. And I, I think that's the, I think that's the, you know, important thing. And to this idea of how, like how principles stack up to become sort of a, the underpinnings of a philosophy. Um, when I was at Anavina Park in Boston last week, it's, it's kind of timely. Uh, Jeremy Keith was giving a talk called the way of the web. Um, and one of his, uh, not one of his slides, but one of his points um, that I, I wish I could remember the the name that this had. And it's, it's from a book um, that he cited that I also don't remember. Um, but there's this stratification that happens and it happens in all things from commerce to marketing to technology to culture. Um, and it's, it's this idea of how, you know, uh, layers of turmoil, we'll call them. Um, and at the topmost layer, you have the most chaotic things that are changing all the time um, that, you know, are constantly being tested and in flux. And um, in this case, uh, he used an example with where JavaScript was at that top layer and this idea that as we are literally recording this, like four JavaScript frameworks have come into existence and already died. Um, like that's the idea at that topmost layer. Below that, you have CSS. CSS changes frequently relatively we're you know every six months or so we get a new thing we just got grids and things like that like it it changes um but below that then we get html html changes every few years then you get urls urls are meant to be kind of an almost immutable record of things and then it dives deeper into like http tcp ip and into the protocols that literally drive the web with this idea that as things become better and it's so like if you think about JavaScript and this idea of JS and CSS, as things become really good in JavaScript, we're starting to see implementations of that stuff in CSS. You know, things like the calc method, we're getting, you know, functional things in CSS now, variables. And these things slowly kind of drip their way down until they get into those middle to lower layers where they sort of become, in this case, the philosophy that would underpin all that the stuff up top is allowed to move around and kind of mature. Then um, it's, it's a neat metaphor. I really, uh, I enjoyed that way of thinking about it, especially because in the talk, he gave of course examples of, of how this works and it, it rang really true to how, you know, how I think about development anyway. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's, I, I think that's really, and, and you know, what's interesting is, and, gosh, and I, I was, I'm sort of frantically, um, you know, looking through sort of all the all the precedents that that we used um, when we when we sort of came up with with uh, purpose driven design. But you know, one of the big influencers was a was a, a developer that gave this great talk, and maybe you've seen it about sort of why every developer should have sort of a like an underlying purpose, right? Like an underlying sort of purpose to their work. And you know, he just sort of decided that you know he felt like. He wanted to make things that gave people an immediate connection to their work. He, he wanted to develop tools that gave artists and animators and storytellers an immediate connection to their work. And he developed all these amazing, you know, sort of like gaming prototyping tools that, that allowed you to sort of instantly, like as you made code changes, sort of instantly see it update. And I think, you know, this was sort of back in the days of, um, where like, you know, it was basically, you know, flash and you had to like code it up and then compile it and kind of see what you got. Right. And, and he sort of really believed that, um, that people should have a more sort of instantaneous, you know, connection. And so he, and, and it, it was, it was so interesting to me that that one belief, you know, led to all these amazingly beautifully designed, um, really innovative, uh, uh, tools, um, and it's telling me that I can't remember his name, but I will, I will definitely send you a link to his, his talk. It was, it was really amazing. Yeah. That'd be great to share with everybody. And that's a good segue though, into talking a little bit about resources. Cause as, as we've said, you know, this, there's a lot here. There's a, there's a ton of stuff to assimilate and you can easily study this stuff for years, but it doesn't hurt to just read a book once in a while or go, you know, watch a video or something just to kind of give yourself that insight. We talk a lot about how easy it is to get into this field, but what ends up separating good designers from great designers 
are these little details that end up working into their processes and into their things. You'd mentioned earlier the universal principles of design. Funny, because I literally have it sitting on my desk to the right of me right now as I've been uh, working my way through it. It is a great book, and for anybody interested, it is probably the best $25 that you will spend if you want to learn about design. You can go buy JavaScript books. You can go pick up the Book Apart series, Smashing uh, Magazine books, Smashing books, um, and they will all be useless to you much more quickly than I think this one would. Um, it's it's structured in a very interesting way. It breaks all of these principles down in like little two, three page chunks and then gives you the next one. Boom, gives you examples, shows you everything. But these deal with web, but also all the other things that complement that. So it's 25 bucks on Amazon. We'll have a link so you can find it easy, um, but absolutely top notch. And I, I totally recommend it to folks. I couldn't agree more. I mean, it is it is it is the best tool that you can have. I think as a designer, when when you can when you can stand in front of a client and present a design, and you have a command of and an understanding of things like affordances and signifiers, and you know the Savannah uh, preference and the flexibility trade off, and sort of all the other um, you know design principles that lurk in that book, it 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 gives you such unbelievable um, power as a designer um, when you go to sort of justify the decisions that you've made, right? Because what you're doing is you're removing subjectivity and fiat mm -hmm. from the equation and you're, you're making um, decisions that are based on sort of laws of the universe, right? That are sort of indisputable and, and, and universal. So. It seems like it'd be very useful when you're in a situation where there's a uh, perhaps a, a conflict of ideas, you know, whether you're squaring off with the you know pointy haired boss or just coworkers or maybe a, a client who believes that you know since their nephew told them that this thing looks good a certain way and he's he knows what's cool that he should listen to him instead. Having this kind of authority as your backing would likely be very use, very useful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think it's the same for developers, right? I mean, I think just I'm, I think just having a, a command of, you know, the underlying the sort of the the, the bigger thought um, that that led you to your decision making, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it's always gonna it's always gonna help. It's never gonna hurt. But general principles like this are often more easily relatable to people who are perhaps not designers as well. It's one thing to say, you know, like, well, these colors don't work because of X, Y, Z whatever, but you know, you have a thing like you mentioned with the flexibility principle, that's a pretty easily abstracted concept that you can be like, Oh, okay. Yeah. I could, I've seen things that's applied to before that's in my it. life. Yeah. yeah. That's it right there. Right. I mean, what you're doing, you're, you're actually giving that person a gift, right? Because mm -hmm. they know the thing that you are about to put a name to. They just never, they just never knew that it had a name. Like they've mm -hmm. always sort of intuitively felt that the existence of that pattern or that principle in the world around them. And you, you great designer, you, you <laughs> articulate, masterful presenting designer have just like unlocked, you've just opened the jar and let out this and, and put a name and a face <laughs> and a, a sort of citation on this thing that they, that they already knew. And I, I think that's always, that's always, uh, you know, a great moment. I, I'm going to open up my nerd box a little bit. Um, the, the guys, of course, can see behind me a little bit while the listeners at home cannot. But the shelf behind me is stacked up with role-playing books. And you the, the way you said that made me immediately think of one of the games that I play where you can get a, a sword that is that has some magical attributes to it. But if you want it to be even better, you can name it. And when you name it, you give it power. <laughs> that's and it. it increases, you know, the, the ability. So that's it, it was immediately what my brain went to when you started describing that. But you're you're absolutely right that giving it that name you know it creates it, it creates an authoritative bubble around you because it's easy to argue with somebody that you view as an equal but the minute somebody starts breaking out you know the actual real world <laughs> knowledge in a meeting it's not facebook you can't just you know shout at somebody like it gives you that ground to say look this is this is the way things work. And like you said, Greg, it's it's kind of a law of nature at this point, the way some of these things work, because it's all about our brains and our brains are wired in certain ways and how they function. Um, 
What about, uh, you know, because I'm sure there at Expand the Room that you guys have, you know, junior UX designers and stuff that come through. What other resources do you point them to that, you know, that you find useful in helping get them up to speed or help them uh, increase their depth in certain areas? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously you, you can't go wrong with the design of everyday things by Don Norman, right? That's just a seminal, you know, piece of work by a complete well, luminary um, in the field. Also Don Norman's, you know, emotional or, uh, yeah, emotional design. Um, you know, I, I think, um, I think people like John Maeda, the laws of simplicity. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's just, you know, there's just an incredible amount of, um, really smart, interesting people who are, you know, contributing to the, the, the sort of, the sort of design commons almost on a daily basis, right? Like Jason Freed, um, at 37 signals with their sort of amazing, uh, blog Zerb, you know, is constantly sort of, you know, pushing on, you know, existing ideas and, and really like, like pushing back on, on things and, you know, challenging things. Um, people like Bruce Mao with his, you know, his incomplete uh, manifesto for change. Um, you know, they're, they're these really powerful, um, you know, amazing collections of of, of thought. Um, you know, I, I I think the the field guide for human centered design that was published by by IDEO is is a, like a don't miss, right? You should you should completely get acquainted with that and. Um, I think, you know, these are all the, these are definitely the, the sort of the 101 um, stuff that we would, you know, point um, junior designers or um, if, if I'm, if I'm teaching any sort of, um, you know, if I'm teaching any sort of uh, UX uh, coursework, those would, those would be like required, you know, reading. Yeah. And I think if to bring this maybe a little bit full circle for us, um, you mentioned IDEO, um, who of course have done great work over the years. And I mentioned uh, Fukasawa earlier. Fukasawa uh, ran. Uh, yeah, he's not still running. I don't think he's long gone. Yeah, he, he ran, ran the, the Japan the, the the Japan presence, right? right. Uh, of IDEO, yeah. So the these things for our listeners, you know, there's a lot of interconnection here in terms of where this stuff comes from and who's producing it and where you know, you know how how things cross pollinate. There's a there's so much cross pollination between um, <laughs> between these ideas. I'm going to let that simmer for a few, though. We're going to go take a break. It'll be a few minutes. For you guys, it'll be about 45 seconds, but we're going to go refill our glasses and come back, and then we're going to start talking about how we take what we've just talked about and start applying it to your web team, to your web process, and what it means for web design. So sit back, relax, go get yourself a drink, and we will see you back here in a few seconds. The Drunken UX Podcast is brought to you by our friends at NewCloud. Are you trying to build a case around an interactive map for your school, city, or business? NewCloud's interactive map platform gives you the power to make and edit a custom interactive map in just minutes. Their team of professional cartographers specialize in map illustrations and are ready to design a rendering to fit your exact needs. One map serves all your users' devices with responsive maps that scale and blend in seamlessly with your website. Visit them online to request a demo at newcloud.com slash drunkenux. That's nucloud.com slash drunkenux. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for sticking with us. You are listening to the Drunken UX podcast, where we are talking about design philosophy with Greg Pedunovich of Expand the Room. They are a full-service digital agency operating out of New York City. You can have them come in and do all the things that's what that means um <laughs> that's that Everything is your new marketing you do yeah, you're, i i dude I, i'm on this i've got your new marketing material down it's it's set uh, he's made uh, windows washed while you wait greg is a super sharp uh experienced designer and so he is going to help us understand now we've we've talked about what philosophy is some of the players in that game you know how to how that kind of functions in this space um, we've thrown around a whole lot of words and a whole lot of schools of thought on it and some resources for you. But now we want to take this and ground it a little bit into something usable um, and, and usable for you, not just for your users. So the first thing I think that I want to kind of get into, and, and we did sort of touch on this, uh, Greg, you brought up MVC, talking about MVC. 
Um, and so thinking about what design philosophy can teach us about the design patterns that we use in web development. So what come you know comes to mind uh, to me immediately is thinking about Brad Frost and atomic design and those principles and this idea of you know minimalism and breaking things down to function over form. You know you you whittle these things down to their barest minimum functional piece so that you can reuse them and plug them together with other things. That is of course but one of a million different ways to think about this, but I want to, I want to spin a little bit here and see, you know, what, what can ph these philosophies teach us about the design patterns we use in web development? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I, you know, I mean, I think we see them all the time again, like, you know, th they're, they're so, there's so much a part of, um, you know, there's so much a part of just that they're just sort of in the ether. Right. And, and so, I mean, I, I think I think that the, just the way that websites, good websites, handle errors, right, is sort of a direct descendant of, you know, the the thinking that came out of you know the design of everyday thing, uh, the, the design of everyday things, and and you know the idea of of sort of user centered design, right? So people are going to make mistakes, right? You're never going to design an error proof interface. Um, but it's sort of like, how do you accommodate? How do you provide error forgiveness? How do you provide, you know, people a way to sort of undo what they've done um, and, and, you know, accommodate for this very basic, you know, human, human trait. Um, I think, you know, I think another, I, I think another one that we're really starting to see emerge and it's, you know, it's starting to get very exciting and unfortunately has sort of mirrored the way that design has sort of manifested in the physical world is around, you know, universal design and sort of the idea of accessibility and creating a, a really, a, a, a truly inclusive uh, web. And, and, you know, I think. You mean like from a 508 accessibility? Exactly. Perspective? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. So it, we're, we're, I think we're now finally starting to crest over a horizon where, the sort of ability to not care whether your site, you know, or your service is um, accessible to people with, you know, visual impairments, with hearing impairments, with, you know, a wide range of disabilities like that, that's becoming sort of a, a luxury of the past. And I, and I, and I, you know, and I think sort of the, the, you know, the school of universal design, which was sort of a, a bunch of, of architects. Um, and I, I think, I think they were sort of, um, doing their work, you know, around the the, night, the, the, the late seventies, uh, uh, led led by a guy with the last name Mace, a, a sort of uh, famous architect. And in fact, um, you know, th they sort of they sort of created this 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 design philosophy that the world should be truly sort of universally accessible, right? And that started to manifest, you know, in in you know these little design things that we see all the time, like curbs that have ramps and sort of that the the sort of bumpy texture mm -hmm. they run into right that 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 are, is there to sort of indicate to people who are visually impaired that they're at a, you know at a crosswalk and things like that and like we're we're starting to see that permeate into the you know into the digital realm mm -hmm. in, in in different ways but you know again i think there's you know an example of sort of a direct descendant of um you know this this school of thought that's that's been around for for a while uh, uh cool. patricia moore is one that i think of with universal design a lot that if if people are looking into um you know as another resource if you're looking into universal design that's another one of those universal design is not a web thing it's it's a school of thought that we have picked up and brought in and said oh yeah we should just be thinking about this very inclusively um but it it started well outside <laughs> of all of this and so it's i as somebody who isn't a designer, it is kind of fascinating to me that when you have that light bulb moment of, oh, yeah, all these things that we're doing, this is old hat to a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, right. Universal design would be more like a philosophy then rather than a principle. Like it's a kind of a collection of principles that make for an accessible interaction. Right, right. Okay. You know, and, and at the time, um, it was pretty, you know, it was pretty groundbreaking thought, right? Like they... You know, they, th this idea that, um, you know, this, this thing that just seems so obvious to us now, you know, this <laughs> idea that like, 
people with disabilities should be included to participate in society just exactly the same you know as everybody else and the designed world should accommodate how you know how 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 people are and people should not have to accommodate the the designed world right which now to us just seems banal right it's so it, it's 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 just it's like it's almost like a like a design truth you know <laughs> to show how easy this is to sort of cross apply to folks too. So I mentioned I've got this universal principles of design book on my desk. Um, Greg, you mentioned the the patterns surrounding error handling um, and all that. If you turn to page 82, there are uh, a breakdown of the types of slips that people make and the types of mistakes they make. And right. it explains them. It gives you the causes behind those and it explains how to give a solution to those to the user. So when I say that this book is phenomenal, it's like you you can't hardly say how do I deal with X without being able to literally just turn to the page and then was it, it's I think it's literally two pages. Yeah, it's exactly two pages. Is it going to be you know the absolute end all be all of explanation? No, but it's going to give you enough to be like, oh okay, I can <laughs> go learn more now or go you know figure out what I need to research there. But that's how useful that book is as a as a uh, resource. For designers and and just to expand on that further it's such a it's such a it's such a nice segue actually into you know an example of of like you know work that you know we we worked for a um we worked for a, a really cool um airline uh it company called CETA, which which basically makes um um you know uh, flight search and uh reservation software for you know a number of, of airlines and sort of took those principles, right? Those very principles and sort of adopted a philosophy um, sort of business-wide, which was like always have the users back, right? Like, like they mm -hmm. took those principles and elevated that to a philosophy that now guides their work, right? It's really like a design isn't approved unless it, you know, unless it meets that sort of philosophical requirement that 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 a user of their software sort of has this inherent feeling that there's someone right that there's that there's a safety net that someone someone's got your back right um, and the way that they achieve that is by applying those principles of error handling right applying things like error forgiveness and the you know the ability to sort of undo errors and the ability to sort of communicate to people when they're about to commit an error right or when they're about to do something that can't be undone don't punish oh. the user for making a mistake. Exactly. <laughs> exactly right. Um, that I had that experience with a booking service of all things. It was a hotel though. Not I remember long, that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I let my search time out because, you know, room reservations can only be held for so long. My search timed out and they're like, okay, well you have to click to go back, but they don't, they didn't save anything. Mm -hmm. So I had to completely execute my search. And it's like, I feel like as a user, you are punishing me because I took too long, which oddly enough, again, in that book, attention is one of the slips that people make. Right. Um, I'm working. I got off on other things. But yeah, that it's it's funny to to look at um, these elements to put a another name to some of this too. Uh, thinking back to Steve Jobs, Jonathan Ivey, these guys, we had the iPhone launch in 2007. iOS came out. It was this new it, fancy thing and they needed to get users to understand how to use you know this this thing called a smartphone because it sure. was it was revolutionary in so many ways um up until this point we had windows ce devices um i can go back to god to 2000 no 1998 99 um, I had a Windows CE palm top, they called them then. Wow. Um, yeah. And it was a little black and white grayscale. You know, oh, it was literally a little chicken keyboard and flip up screen. Did you play Dope Wars on it? Uh, yes, I did. I think yes. matter of fact. Um, <laughs> Anyone who had a palm top that knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> when I graduated and gone off to college, I worked at a Sears. And at one point I had a chance to buy a, a compact something. But it was, it was the handheld version of that with now... It was Windows CE, but it still had a color screen, but it was still Windows. It looked like Windows 95 in your hand, basically. Um, they hadn't really expanded. There was no Wi-Fi. There was no cellular. It was just literally a little palm-held computer. So iOS said, "How we can't do that. We have to make this right. And so this is where we really start throwing around this word skeuomorphism, right? This idea of replicating in a digital space physical things. And the, you know, the classic example is a volume knob. 
Mm -hmm. There's no reason a knob has to exist in a digital interface, but we do it because it's familiar and it lets users understand I can turn this and make volume go up because that's what I do on my stereo or, you know, in my car or whatever. Um, and they have used their approach to design and this, you know, this philosophy of trying to make things easy for the users, familiar and enjoyable. But that has changed and evolved over time. And you see that specifically in iOS as they have slowly dropped the skeuomorphic elements. They've sure. gone to the less three-dimensional elements into flat design and things like that. Um, and how that philosophy has informed them as people now can know and intuit uh, again to now switch to a totally different uh, designer at that point. Um, you're able to intuit the way things should work. Um, and they have learned and refined that process. They haven't stood still on it. They've changed it. They've evolved. Um, but I think that by itself, because it's in such a compressed, I mean, we're only talking about 10 years here, yeah. but we've seen so much happen. And it and it's so isolated and encompassed that it makes. I mean, there will be PhDs written, I think, on that ten year time span from <laughs> what are we on iOS eleven right. now nine. Well, I don't well know. just think about. It. I mean, think about this. Like, think about the, think about the term the fold. Let's talk about the fold, right? Like this <laughs> is something <laughs> we pull our hair out about, you know, um, at, at ETR. And you know, first of all, that is that that, that is basically. You know that's from a newspaper, right? Metaphor, right? The the fold refers to a broadsheet newspaper that's on a newsstand, and this sort of idea that the like most coveted real estate is above the fold, right? Like that's what a person is going to see when they're walking by uh, on their way to work, and they see the headline about a caped, you know, superhero spotted in the city. That's above the fold, right? Well, so for a long time, this notion that anything that was sort of below where the browser window ended at the bottom of the screen was below the fold and was this sort of like wasteland where <laughs> like the second page of Google search results. Right? And like the and then, <laughs> and then you know, for a couple of years we had these little uh down arrows, these little remember those, those little medallions that sort of pointed <laughs> And told you that there's more stuff if you would only you know you scroll, can scroll down. If you, <laughs> if you would only just use your mouse or your, you know, your your trackpad and and scroll down. You know, there's all sorts of you know more goodies. And and now you know, I think for the most part, like the discussion of the fold has has gone away, right? I mean, um, sometimes we will design screens to have a little hint of sort of content peeking out, you know, over the sort of bot, you know, over the, the top of the browser line. But for the most part, you know, users now know that there's plenty of valuable um, content. And if you're, you know, a Redditor, you, you know very well, there's just an infinitely scrollable amount of stuff that you can find to completely waste a, a workday, right? To confirm. And that becomes true like the the evolution of this is something we just had on real time overview is um this idea of bidirectional scrolling and so you see that now this hint of if you have an element within a vertical scroll you've got that hint of a horizontal um, right and netflix is sort of mm -hmm. the go-to example of this that on these mobile devices they give you that cue of hey you can you can do this over time. I think, you know, this is one of those things we will assimilate this just into the way we work and it will become obvious that, oh yeah, you just, when you see things, you know, layered this way, you grab them, you, you move them along. The, the interesting solution then is then getting into universal design, you know, making those things easy to navigate um, for people with motor control issues mm -hmm. and things like that. Like the, the design of those elements goes beyond just the visual. It goes into the mechanical then in terms of how we adapt to those different things and those different uh, those so modalities cool with that is if you had a mobile app when you're browsing something and you're holding it in portrait mode to scroll like vertically and then when you're on when you have an item selected that you like then you tilt your phone to landscape mode and that puts you into horizontal scroll so you can see more oh that'd be really cool i well we have i mean we do have orientation detection now that's a thing yeah yeah but i want to see that specifically have netflix or or anyone their free idea for you <laughs> i just want to see it <laughs> the, the sort of anti-pattern to this is when we talk about 
dark UX, right? That right. good design philosophy is all about the user and making their experience better because our goal as a designer is to make something people want to use because we're selling a product or we're trying to build a tool people, you know, will engage with. Um, whatever the case may be, the way we do that is by making our thing better. But dark, but dark UX is the anti-pattern to that in that it's it, it it does not conform to any of these things because it's all about taking, you know, the idea of, uh, and I think Aaron, you had mentioned uh, uh, before the show, we were talking about the download buttons. Oh, yeah. You, you go to, <laughs> and this isn't true anymore. And, and so no, I will. No, it still is. No, I'm I'm thinking oh. specifically of a uh, um, oh uh, before GitHub uh, oh uh, source Source Forge. Forge. Yeah, remember uh, they've been bought now by another company that is trying to do much better with all of this. But there was that period where they were owned by whoever owned them, where you would land on that page and it's like yeah. Source Forge was a good, known, trustworthy source for a long it time. Really and then was you, yeah. Then you land there and it's like you've got three ads that are fake download ads uh -huh. um you have to oh, click yeah. through stuff to get there like oh yeah they let all these dark patterns bleed in because they i mean and and not to put too fine a point on but they basically gave up on their users at that point mm -hmm. it was just about trying to get money and yeah, that's what them. happens when yeah. that comes in right so i think going back to the original statement that i that i made at the sort of top of the hour right which is that that the like that is leveraging a design principle, right? That is leveraging something that Steve Krug sort of you know articulated really, really well in uh, "Don't Make Me Think," which is also a uh, a must read for for anyone interested in this in this kind of stuff, right? Which is that people people don't take that like people see a button and they're going to click it. Like people looking to um, complete a task like downloading, um, you know, a free goodie. As soon as they see a download button or anything that looks remotely like a download button, they're going to click it. They're not going to read any of the surrounding text. They're not going to, you know, do anything besides click. And so, you know, the other dark pattern that I always, you know, always see is like a, you know, a call to action button when you land on a page and an ad is sort of perfectly timed, like a banner ad is perfectly timed to load and sort of knock that button out of your click path right before you're about to drop your click, thing. right? And then you inadvertently click on some crappy, you know, banner ad that you, you never would have clicked on, right? So if you're a bad designer, you can leverage people's, um, the, the you know, you can leverage the, the sort of, you know, underlying principle that people are going to, people looking for um, something to click are going to do it. It's called satisficing. They're going to scan the page until they see the thing that might be the thing that will get them what they want and they're going to click it, right? If you're a good designer, you're going to provide, you know, you're going to provide a little bit of error handling. You're going to, uh, you're going to provide a little bit of error prevention. You're going to make sure that even if they accidentally click that button, which they are probably going to do, because they're human beings, right? That you provide them a way back. You provide them a little bit of error forgiveness. If you're a bad designer, you're gonna make it so that they click on an ad that they never intended to, you know, to, to click on. But they so both it, leverage the same behavioral trait in the same. And it's the opposite of applying the philosophy. It's taking advantage of the philosophy. It's yeah. knowing how people are going to behave and using that to your advantage rather than theirs. A, a lazy designer would be like on SourceForge where they would have a very banal looking download button that gets superseded by exciting and fancy looking download links all around it. But but a, a dark UX designer will intentionally make a very like diminished looking download link so that users click on the wrong one because it gives them a click through ad revenue. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's. Um, I'm going to assume that all the the good listeners of this, uh, you know, this podcast are principled designers who, you know, are are determined to to use, you know, design to to give people their time back and to make you know tasks easier and remove obstacles from from people and and, and eliminate pain points. So, but and to that point, when we talk about. I let, let's say the, the users have bought in. They're like, man, this sounds great. I'm going to go read some of these philosophies. I'm going to figure out what rings true to me and who I want to be as a designer and how I want to help people put their brand forward or their site forward. 
let's talk a little bit about integration because it can be difficult, especially for, you know, there are two types, right? We've got teams, whether that's an agency or it's, you know, a, a group within another organization versus the freelancer slash, you know, uh, sole proprietor type setup that it's, it's one thing to say, here's how I'm going to do it. Here's what my philosophy is versus the organizational philosophy. And that's where I think, Greg, I, I want you to maybe e that, explain to folks how you approach that for expand the room. It's a, you know, it's a great question. And, and um, you know, like I, I, I think I alluded to it before, but I, but I think, you know, I think much of it sort of hinges on abandoning this, this idea that, that, um, you know, whatever your design philosophy is, has to be some new original, you know, unsaid idea, right? Because I think we've illustrated really clearly that even the great design thinkers are sort of, you know, picking up where the last one left off. This is a lineage. You as a designer are among peers. You are totally part of that lineage and, and you should feel completely free to pick up these ideas and, you know, sort of craft them and, and, and make them your own as long as they're they're true, right? As long as they're really, they really reflect who you are, you know, I, I sort of feel like they'll, they'll work. And, and that was definitely the approach we took at ETR when we started going down the road with, 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 um, you know, with purpose-driven design was, you know, we really wanted it to be authentic. And, and that meant two things, right? That meant it, 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 it we wanted it to be a reflection of who we are and sort of where we've been. But it also we wanted it to be a reflection of who we want to be, you know, and, and sort of what we aspire to. So, you know, I, I think, you know, I think the, the real truth is there are probably elements of, of, of our design principles and of purpose driven design where we're, we're not quite where we want to be. Right. But we now have this this kind of signpost that, that we can use um, to get ourselves there. We've made a declaration now that this is you know, who we are and who we want to become. So, um, and then the other thing that I, I think is, um, you know, we sort of, we avoided, um, you know, making it too much about process, right? About the sort of how to of, you know, how we move projects from ideas to, you know, actual products or services or websites with, you know, working functional code. And, um, you know, we really wanted it to, to be more about how we approach the work, right? Like, and, and sort of our point of view on our role um, as, as designers. So I, I think, you know, I think those, I think those two things are, are really key. And then, you know, if you're in an organization, um, what we did was we just sort of turned our own process on ourselves, right? And we did a, you know, we did sort of a deep discovery process internally, um, you know, uh, captured sentiment and ideas and, and, you know, things that people found frustrating, things that inspired people, you know, around the whole organization and sort of captured all of that. And then, you know, got out the sticky notes and the Sharpies and the whiteboard and sort of, you know, started to organize all that stuff until we could stand back from it and, and you know, and, and see some patterns. And we started to see some common themes develop, right? And then it was a matter of, of sort of prioritizing those themes and really figuring out what was like, what was the stuff, you know, we, we had to, to say. Uh, and then from there, it was just a long process of, of kind of wordsmithing, right. Of, of, of just getting the, you know, the language, right. Um, and you know, what's interesting about, um, what's interesting about where we're at is one of the things that we sort of agreed on was that we were going to leave it open, um, to sort of go back and, and tweak these things, right? Like, like let's let's write our philosophy and then let's live with it and see, you know, see what principles we can really like turn up the knob on, right? Like, like maybe there's something that we have, you know, we have, you know, something really bold or, um, you know, something that has a, you know, big impact to say about, you know, our principle around um, collaboration or our principle around empathy. Right. And, and, and that, you know, the way that we can start to further distinguish ourselves and further sort of differentiate from other design agencies is by starting to like turn up the knobs on those principles that we really, really uh, embrace and, and feel like we have something to, you know, to say.
And this isn't to imply to anybody that this is an easy process because this is something, you know, obviously you guys went in with some of the pieces in your hands, but it's still, that was still a process to get that put together and finalized. And, you know, there was effort uh, involved and it's not to imply to folks this is easy or something that you should just decide and run with. Um, expand the room. What you guys did is phenomenal, um, but it, it took work. Um, I mean, there's probably months of back and forth, I'm sure reflected in, in what you've crafted so far. Yeah. Well, thanks. I mean, you know, we, yeah, we did, we, you know, we, we worked hard on it and, and sort of put it out in the world. It's been really, you know, it's been really well received. And, and I, I think mostly, um, you know, mostly cause it's, it's, it's authentic and it's, you know, it's true. And, and, you know, I, I think that, I think, you know, we certainly acknowledge that, you know, none of it is original thinking, right? Like they're, they're, these aren't I, our ideas. We've borrowed, you know, from people and we've tried to, you know, give credit where, where, you know, credit's due. And, um, and then, you know, we've definitely picked up on some things that are just so, um, you know, so in the design culture that they're, they, they're really, you know, don't belong to any, you know, one person or group. They're just, they're just sort of part of the, you know, the design commons. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think, I, I just, you know, the thing that I, I emphasize is, is just, it, it just has to be authentic. It has to be real or it's not going to work. And I can only imagine too, right. That when it's all said and done and you, you've put this thing together um, and this is specific to folks who are working, whether it's at an agency or a team or whatever the case may be, but having something like that in your toolbox has to be an incredible hiring tool for you. Um, yeah. Wow. That, yeah, that's a, that's a great point. We, uh, it's funny because um, our, our, our most recent hire, who's a, a, a fabulous young designer uh, named Karen McLaughlin um, came, came to us, you know, we were, we were searching for, um, you know, a, a, someone to join the, the UX team. And, um, you know, she, she came in and, and, um, you know, among the, you know, things that she talked about was sort of her excitement at the idea of, of, you know, working somewhere who sort of put, you know, a stake in the ground around these, these principles. And, and, um, we were, we were really struck by that. And, and, you know, we realized that like, this is someone who gets us and these things are important to her and like, we can work with that, right? Like, like that, you can't, you can't you can't teach that. You can't train that into someone. We can definitely teach, you know, Karen how to do a, you know, an effective stakeholder interview or how to do a card sort or, you know, how to, um, you know, put together, uh, you know, uh, an effective prototype test. Right. But, you know, the, the thing that we would never be able to train her to do is to sort of have a value of the, you know, uh, of the sort of principles that, that we value uh, as well. So. Yeah, that's I. That's one of the things that I find really interesting from the people standpoint and the hiring standpoint is this process. And you know, I think maybe it, it keys on me since I work for an organization whose job it is to find other people jobs. I guess, right. but you know, that idea of because I've I've used a, a phrase similar to that I tell people like I can teach you HTML, I can teach you JavaScript, I can teach you our patterns and and our workflow, but I can't teach you to communicate necessarily and knowing you know uh sussing out those skills and finding you know those little bits that show that this is the person that fits what we're going to do can be a huge challenge um especially if you go through a lot of people or you're a large organization so being able to have somebody that can key into those values from the very start um uh, or who can talk about you know we we talk we've talked a lot about on previous episodes about getting jobs in this industry and learning and getting started and when you interview, uh, anybody will tell you asking questions to your interviewer is a, a really valuable thing to have. And if I was sitting across the table from uh, an applicant and they said, oh, yeah, I was reading your philosophies and I wanted to ask you about X, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. that tells you in the question that tells you so much about them that they took the time to learn about you, that they were interested in what that meant that they want to know how that applies to, you know, the way they work and the way you work. There's a lot to be learned in there. There's a whole lot of meat to that process. And yeah, yeah it's, it's, there's, I'm sure, you know, if you calculate how much money you spent hour wise putting it together, there's a lot there, but uh, it's, 
hopefully recouped in you know the value of the people that you attract then i think it, it also it also says that the employee uh, has enough self-worth and values their time enough that they'd be they'd consider turning someone down if it wasn't a good fit for them no i think no that's exactly <laughs> right right i mean you know i i think the you know the other the other piece of this is that it's not for everybody right and and uh um you could if you were cynical uh look at our look at our philosophy right and read our principles and you could totally just roll your eyes right and uh, you know and 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 you could be really cynical about um the the things that we're that we're saying um and and you know i know agencies tend to have a pretty bad reputation and i think i think some of it you know is probably rightfully so um you know about just having this you know having this sort of desire to get in and sell clients on the big, bright, shiny object and get out, you know, while the, you know, while the getting's good. And, um, you know, that's just, that's just not, that's just not in our, our DNA. You know, we're, we're, we work together. We're, we're a cohesive team. Um, we show up every day because we're really interested in sort of figuring out how to bring people value, right. How to, we're really interested in, in, in you know, this idea of like giving people time back, right. Giving them their time back. Like that's, a huge goal for us. And, um, you know, we're really driven by, you know, providing, you know, um, you know, providing people with more than what they paid for, right. More value than, than sort of, you know, what, what, what they paid for. And if that's not important to you, or if you don't believe that about us, um, it's, you know, it's definitely not going <laughs> to, it's definitely not going to be a good fit, um, to, to come, to come be a part of the team. So the penultimate question, not the penultimate, the ultimate question, uh, <laughs> As an agency, and this can apply to as a freelancer, as a person doing web development, um, how do you explain this to a client when they come in and they want to work with you? And, uh, you know, I'm sure the folks who come to you guys kind of have a sense of that maybe already. Um, but certainly for the freelancer that's out there that's working, you know, contract to contract, and they just are taking the work as it comes. And somebody comes in and asks, you know, hey, we want to make some of these changes. And you have to stand there in front of them and explain that, well, this is how my design philosophy is. And here's the thing about what you're asking for. It's, you know, it's not good for the user because of X and Y. What is your advice in terms of explaining that, you know, when a request might conflict with that philosophy or, you know, might, might just conflict, maybe not with philosophy, but with bad UX? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a, man, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. It's a tough dilemma, you know, that, that um, I think anyone in the service industry um, has to face, right? I, I, I'm going to go off on a little tangent here, but I think it's worth it. Um, I, so I have become recently like kind of morbidly fascinated with um, reading about and watching movies about um, disastrous uh, trips up Everest, right? <laughs> I don't know why it's. I know, it's I know. It, I know. It makes me just a sick, horrible person. But I've just been riveted by these <laughs> these stories of these expeditions that go bad, right? And the thing that always happens is the you know the the Sherpa guide uh, as they're getting to the summit is like dude, it's not a good idea. Like it is not good. We're not good to go. And, you know, the, the, the sort of like these rich, you know, clients who have hired these, these people, you know, ignore their advice and go up and then they all freeze to death and die. Right. Or they lose limbs and it's horrible. And, you know, I, I, you know, I, it's funny. Cause I, I like, I, I, I definitely empathize with those, guides, these expert, you know, guides who are trying to, who can see, you know, this, this, this thing happening. Right. And also really empathize with this idea that they're, you know, they are, you know, they're, they're in sort of a, they're in a service industry, right? Like they are, you know, they're, they're sort of hired to, to do this thing. Part of the thing is to try to protect. Right. Um, but so, okay, there's that tangent. Now back to the, <laughs> back to the meat of the, of the question, you know, there's never a moment where um, we're deep in a project where a client sort of uh, hears from us like, "Oh, I'm, you know, I'm sorry, this is 
this thing goes against our philosophy. Like we introduce this stuff at the very beginning of our relationship with, with anyone. And this is just about the first thing that anyone will hear about us, right? Is getting an understanding of like these principles that we believe in, how those principles inform our process, right? We can give you a very comprehensive overview of how we are going to take your problem and move it all the way through, you know, the sort of discovery and definition and, you know, design and development, you know, cycles to come out the other end. But, you know, for us, the important thing is that all of that stuff is rooted in these sort of core beliefs. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I think as long as those are, as long as those core beliefs are also valuable to the client, then, you know, then, then I think it's a pretty easy sell, right? I mean, I, I think as long as we can demonstrate that the, the work is rooted in, um, things that are sort of bigger than our own personal opinions, right? That, that, that they're, that they're rooted in, in sort of a combination of best practices and understanding of principles. Um, the fact that we've gone out and tested and sort of iterated and, and gathered data, um, and, and tried to sort of verify all of our, you know, assumptions and opinions. And then the fact that the whole thing is sort of rooted in this, in this higher, you know, guiding principle. I think that always works to our advantage. Um, yeah, introduce it early and leverage, you know, if you're, especially if you are a, a single person, um, you know, freelancing, trying to make your way, pick the values that check high on that list and sell those early use, you know, go back to these books, universal principles of design, Steve crew, whoever you need to go find and sell those as, your value add show that that works and use that to then work your way into your other values and philosophies and principles that I think is kind of the technique to, to making that work. It doesn't mean you have to sell out any principles or anything like that, but it's about understanding the process that will help you get your client to understand the value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I no, I think that's right. And, and, you know, um, our, we have a, we have a great, uh, senior designer, uh, Allison Bright, who, who, who works out of Memphis and she, you know, she sort of pointed out this idea that, you know, we, you know, we, we, we do a lot of thinking around empathy, right. And sort of empathizing with end users. And we find ourselves, you know, sort of advocating a lot for end users. Right. And she, you know, she had this like brilliant, statement about, you know, the importance of sort of having empathy for client stakeholders and having empathy for our clients as well, and really understanding where they are and where they're coming from. And just, you know, knowing that there's a, there's a whole ecosystem, you know, that, that they have on their side that, that we have to fully understand. And that sometimes, you know, a willful rejection of a great idea that we have or something that we think will really give them a lot of value or bring a lot of innovation. Um, there are a lot of reasons why that might get rejected. And none of them are that, you know, this person wants this project to be bad or they want it to fail, right? Everyone wants to do the, the best possible work. And I think, um, you know, I think that was a great insight about Allison and it was a great opportunity for us to sort of turn that principle towards ourselves, right? And, you know, our the, the, the sort of principle that we have around empathy, you know, and, and, and really sort of, you know, turn it on ourselves and, and, you know, apply it to, to uh, have better, you know, shared understanding with where our clients are coming from. Yeah. Well, Greg, I want to thank you for coming on the show with us this evening. It's been awesome having you on to talk about this. Um, I want to give the closing round to you. So tell the listeners, you know, what, where they can find you, what you've got coming up and, and what you want them to know about whether you, what expand the room is doing or, or anything else. Cool. Well, well, before I do that, I just want to thank you guys once again for uh, having me on. It's been, it's been really fun. Um, I think it's really exciting um, work that you're doing. It's a, it's a great um, podcast and, and uh, I was honored and delighted to, to be invited on to, uh, to drink uh, scotch and beer and, uh, Aaron, I forgot what you're drinking already. A, a vodka tonic with oh, vodka and lime. We didn't pay him to say that, folks. I swear. <laughs> <laughs> so we are. Uh, so at ETR, we are. Uh, what are we doing? We, well, we, we've been really uh, putting a lot of focus in 2018 on sort of you know better establishing and cultivating our presence on Medium. 
Um, the the um, our, our great new young designer Karen McLaughlin recently published an article um, chronicling our sort of experiment as uh, as we're moving to be a fully distributed uh, virtual office. A very very nice little article. Um, the incomparable uh, Reed Hit, one of our uh, very senior designers and an overall awesome guy, is going to be uh, publishing an article very soon about um, sort of design systems and our, our thinking around that. And then um, Shannon Rooch, who's um, on on the uh, UX team, I, I believe, will be following up with an article uh, fairly soon about uh, our take on sort of on uh, content strategy. So those are um, coming down the pipeline in, in Medium. Uh, but I think the thing that we're really excited about right now is um, we will very soon be publishing a sort of uh, beta version of the Purpose Driven Design Toolkit, which I think is very, you know, gets its roots, you know, very much from like the IDEO Human Centered Design Field Manual and the Service Design Toolkit from uh, Naman in, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, this is basically a, a web-based library that has all of our sort of resources um, that, that move us through the process all the way from, you know, discovery into definition and, and into design. Uh, it includes, you know, our, our, our eight principle philosophy, but has lots and lots of, you know, templates and worksheets and canvases and just sort of all the things that we do uh, with clients and um, with, you know, with uh, developers and, and designers to, you know, turn really awesome ideas into really awesome uh, products and services. So um, that will be available and, and sort of out there for anyone to use, remix, share, whatever, whatever they want. Just, you know, hopefully people will get some, some good use out of them. Awesome, dude. Yes. Thanks for letting us know. And we will make sure to let our listeners know as soon as that's available. That's not a plug. That's not a sponsorship, anything like that. I think it's awesome. And I want to make sure that they get to hear about that. Cool. Thank Speaking you. Of sponsorships. What about them? You tell me. <laughs> Don't we have a message from our sponsors? Oh, yeah. No, we do. <laughs> Here, wait. Let, let's, let's go out. We'll have them play. And then we'll come back. How does that sound? <laughs> I like it. The Drunken UX Podcast is brought to you by our friends at NewCloud. NewCloud is an industry-leading interactive map provider who has been building location-based solutions for organizations for a decade. Are you trying to find a simple solution to provide your users with an interactive map of your school, city, or business? Well, NewCloud's interactive map platform gives you the power to make and edit a custom interactive map in just minutes. They have a team of professional cartographers who specialize in map illustrations of many different styles and are ready to design an artistic rendering to fit your exact needs. One map serves all of your users' devices with responsive maps that are designed to scale and blend in seamlessly with your existing website. To request a demonstration or to view their portfolio, visit them online at newcloud.com slash drunkenUX. That's nucloud.com slash drunkenUX. Thanks for listening tonight to the Drunken UX podcast. We had Greg Baranovich from Expand the Room. Uh, it's great to have you aboard again. I think we got a we got an RTO coming up on Wednesday, right, Michael? Real time overview every Wednesday or Thursday, depending on how the schedule falls. <laughs> actually, yeah, no, and we will have it this uh, this uh, actually this Wednesday next or prior Wednesday. It'll be the fourth, but there will be a real time overview on the fourth. So, um, yeah, definitely tune in for that. Heck, I don't know. I guess check us out on Facebook and Twitter if you want to. We're at Drunken UX at both those places. Uh, hit drunkenux.com slash Slack. If you have anything to add, uh, let us know what you think. Who are your favorite designers? Who you know? Who has taught you the best lessons in your life? Drop by our show notes. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think and what you feel has inspired you and what you feel is true to you. Greg, man, thank you so much for coming yeah. with us tonight. Awesome. And I learned a lot today. today. <laughs> it, was a lot it was a lot of fun. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks and until next you. time, I can only leave everybody with one last final thought, and that is, guys, I need you to keep your personas close and your users closer. <laughs> <laughs>